Good evening. Welcome to this lecture on the rise of Constantine. Constantine, of course, is a very important figure in late antiquity, even more so because of his effects on Christianity. It is because of Constantine that uh, arguably Christianity became the powerful force that it was in the Middle Ages. Well, how did Constantine come to be, again, the sole ruler of a very large empire? You'll remember that when we left it, um, the empire had been divided into a tetrarchy. Well, starting in 305 AD, that tetrarchy began to fall apart in a dizzying array of uh, successions and rebellions and civil wars. I'm only going to only give you this, the gist of it because, seriously, it's hard to follow. Uh, so let's just start with this. Diocletian got real sick, and he and Maximian stepped down together. Uh, a lot of historians will say that probably Diocletian forced Maximian to step down because, as we've said, the Tetrarchy was not a true balance of power. Diocletian really was still sort of first man in the empire. After that, of course, the Caesars rose up in their place. That was the thing that was supposed to take to happen. Uh, Galerius in the east came to take Diocletian's place, and Constantius in the west took Maximian's. Yes, Constantius is the father of Constantine. So, of course, everyone's sitting around thinking, oh, I know what's going to happen here. Constantine's going to become Caesar. Maximian's son, Maxentius, will become Caesar under Galerius. And so they thought, obviously, Constantine and Maxentius were, these two sons were going to rise up. If you hear echoes of this persistent problem of succession now, um, it's not an illusion. It is, in fact, the same old problem coming up again. Sons thinking they should take the place of their fathers, um, not everyone agreeing on that. Well, in the end, Constantine and Maxentius get snubbed. There's this story, there's this, um, comes down to us of Diocletian announcing his retirement and on the same day, preparing to announce the new Caesar. Everyone's kind of looking around at Constantine thinking, ah, here you go, big boy. Uh, but in fact, uh, his name was never mentioned. So Constantine and Maxentius are disgruntled and are wanting to um, wanting the power that they think they deserve. Well, eventually, Constant Constantine's dad dies, Constantius, okay? And Constantine does get his chance to become Caesar, partly because... He had a huge army, and they all said, we want this guy to be emperor. And so there he was made Caesar um, under Galerius. And that just set in motion a series of, like I said, uh, people getting passed over, people getting snubbed, lots of rebellions going on here. Almost everyone in this uh, involved in this thing dies, except for two people. They are Maxentius, son of the former Augustus Maximian, who had originally served with Diocletian, and Constantine, son of Constantius, the second of the Augustuses to serve in the Tetrarchy. These two were left, and for a time they were able to rule um, together, kind of holding this Tetrarchy together, but um, Maxentius uh, and Constantine could not get along forever. <laughs> and eventually, Maxentius uh, in the West was in charge of Rome, and Constantius, coming actually from the Western provinces, uh, waged war on his primary rival. The two men met at the famous Milvian Bridge in 312 AD. This is, in fact, a picture of that Milvian Bridge with perhaps some original stones in it. Now, this is famous in a large part because uh, it's at this battle that Constantine sees a vision. In the setting sun, there is a symbol in the sky that looks like this. And he also gets a message, a word, perhaps in his head, ringing in his ears, and it was in tuto nika, which is Greek for in this sign conquer, or in this sign you shall conquer. Well, he knew well enough what this was. It was a famous Christian symbol. It had occurred in many places already. 
Um, it is the first two letters in the Greek word Christos, or Christ. Constantine took these words to heart, took it to be a message from God himself, and had this symbol, the Cairo, painted onto all of his shields. It would later become a formal part of his battle standard called the Labarum. Well, Maxentius had already endured two sieges in Rome from Constantine, so it's not altogether clear why on uh, in October 312 he decided to come out and meet his rival, but he did. Now, in his preparations for siege, earlier sieges, he had destroyed the actual stone bridge, which you can see up in the corner of the picture there. Uh, he destroyed the stone bridge enough so that Constantine dared not cross it, perhaps to keep Constantine from having access to the city. So he had built a pontoon bridge or some sort of temporary bridge for his own troops to get across, thinking that he could fight on the opposite side of the Tiber, and if things didn't go well, he could retreat across his bridge, destroy it quickly, and Constantine would still be stuck on the opposite shore. However, he underestimated his rival. Constantine was a master general. Very soon, Constantine's cavalry had broken through the cavalry of Maxentius, and the troops um, of Maxentius made a mad rush for the pontoon bridge. They overwhelmed the bridge, and in their frenzied retreat, um, started to actually tear the thing apart. And in the end, Maxentius and most of his army drowned in the Tiber. Constantine had defeated his rival with about a quarter of his available troops, which just goes to show the genius of this guy as a military leader. After this, as I said, Constantine routinely fought under the Labarum, and fight he did. He was fighting all the time, fighting multiple wars, uh, sometimes with his own rivals, sometimes um, with other uh, barbarian or eastern forces. But when he did so, he fought under this um, under this standard, the Labarum, and it is it, it came to be known as kind of Constantine's standard, and it has there at the top the Cairo symbol mixed. Uh, sort of joined together. Well, to celebrate his victory at the Milvian Bridge, Constantine had a had an arch built, a triumphal arch, and this was fairly common in his day. What was not common was some of the features of this triumphal arch. So let's start with just a, a basic picture of the arch, which still stands today in Rome. Here's a picture of the arch. Now it looks nice, it looks ordinary to the um, to the common eye, but what we need to understand is that so much of this arch was not actually built uh, fresh by Constantine. In fact, uh, many parts of it were taken from other monuments that had been uh, dedicated or built to other emperors. We have here no less than three other emperors contributing to the Arch of Constantine. Uh, the use of these things is called the use, we call it the use of spoila. Okay, that's sort of the technical art term here. Grabbing other uh, artwork from past monuments and placing it on your own monument. That's called using spoila. Well, the other thing that is interesting about this arch is that it represents a sort of transition in the sculpture of the time. The earlier emperors had had their monuments built in a kind of traditional Hellenistic style. And you'll notice that here, these they're called roundels, these circles that you see here. They are traditional Hellenistic art. The characters come, look how the characters come out away from the background. It seems that they are kind of standing in some open air. The flatness of the background, the proportionality of the characters all gives it a typically Hellenistic, lifelike um, feeling. Now, if we go down to the frieze below it, you can see the frieze is right below it. Now, that frieze below it is actually original art done in the time of Constantine, and it has a much different character to it. Let me give you a quick view of this. I'm just gonna, so you can see as it moves past here, notice the characters. Their hair looks like little helmets on their head. They're squatty all mashed together. 
And this art is, it's, most folks just take it as a decline, um, a loss of skill and refinement, and the reasons for it are unclear. Uh, some possibilities include the crisis of the third century. You'll remember that from 235 to roughly 285, um, we had 26 different emperors and there was chaos. Living as an artist was by no means a reliable occupation at this time. Um, it could also have been just an influence, uh, just a preference, I'm sorry, for an, a simpler common style. Could have been perhaps uh, the influx of different styles from perhaps barbaric, uh, or I should say Germanic, artists coming from um, the outlying provinces. We don't know. What we do know is that the artwork here has changed dramatically. Uh, if you take go back to the Five Good Emperors, there is still that clear Hellenistic influence. Now that's being lost. Things are getting cruder, rougher, squattier and, and less attention is being paid to the quality of it all. That's not the only thing that came about here. There was an, also another new order. Um, the victory of Milvian Bridge, we need to remember, only placed Constantine in a new and very fragile tetrarchy. He ruled in the west and a man named Licinius ruled in the east. Um, the two met at a very famous um, wedding ceremony in Milan in 313 AD to seal their new alliance through marriage. And it was at this um, wedding ceremony that the supposed Edict of Milan was written. Now the Edict of Milan is probably something of a misnomer. This was probably more of an informal agreement between these two men on how to treat Christians. You'll remember that back in the day, Pliny had wondered, what do we do about the Christians? And he'd written to Trajan and Trajan had given him a basic uh, strategy, which was don't go after them, but if they are accused, you can do that. You can, you, you can handle that as the situation arises. And then later with Decius and of course with Diocletian, the persecution became more aggressive and more systematic. Well, a lot of property had been confiscated from Christians, you know, any places that they were meeting, uh, sometimes even personal property. And at Milan, Constantine and Licinius agreed to give all of that back and to treat Christianity as just another legal religion. You know, Rome has tons of these sort of uh, different cults, the cult of different gods, uh, even some mystery religions. Now Christianity was just welcomed in that, and a lot of the things that had been confiscated were given back. But in terms of really reducing persecution, it, it pales in comparison to the earlier Edict of Toleration, which was in fact an edict. And you'll remember that it was issued by Galerius, who himself had um, instigated so much of the persecution under Diocletian. It, it was issued by Galerius because he was on his deathbed, and he needed all the help he could get. And so he essentially said, um, you know, I'll, I'll legalize this religion, I'll tolerate it, you guys pray for me, and that was the Edict of Toleration. So while the Edict of Milan tends to get more press, probably historically, Christians should be a little bit more excited about the Edict of Toleration in which uh, Christianity really was um, recognized as a, an acceptable religion, not in any way a state religion or an official religion, but an acceptable religion, and uh, their, eventually their property would be given back, but man, ending the, the great persecution in itself was enough. Um, so we're left with these two characters, Constantine in the West, Licinius in the East, and as I said, the the uh, <laughs> the, the new agreement was was fragile. And ar around 323, uh, Licinius and Constantine go back to war. Uh, Licinius is defeated. Constantine becomes sole ruler of the Roman Empire in 323 A.D. and will remain so for about 14 more years till 337 AD. Here is an interesting uh, historical note that may help you hold some of this stuff in memory. 323 is an important number if we go on the other side of the millennia and go into the BC era. It is the year that Alexander the Great died. Alexander's death marks the beginning of a Hellenistic age, an age in which Greek influence would spread and change uh, almost all of Mediterranean culture, from Israel, Egypt, 
uh, up in Asia Minor. Uh, all of these cultures were drastically changed by Alexander's having brought with him the culture and learning of his Hellenistic homeland. Constantine began his sole reign in 323 AD. Now his reign marked a new era for Christianity, which in time would also influence, and you might want to say be influenced, also by the Roman world. But even on an official level now, Christianity would rise to be a kind of influential force in culture. So 323, the beginning of Hellenistic culture in which Hellenism mixes with the broader Mediterranean world. 323 AD, Constantine the Great uh, brings Christianity into a place where it can begin to influence and be influenced by the greater Roman world. Now, another note, both rulers were the last ones to rule over a unified empire. Alexander's successors, generals like Ptolemy and Seleucus, fought over his empire and divided it up, as would Constantine's sons. So, that's it for tonight. Hope you've enjoyed this lecture. We'll see you soon.